you are. Um, <laughs> so can you can you uh, give uh, like a quick uh, introduction to what are we going to do? And I will just uh, run my grasshopper and, and show stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, shall I share my screen then? Wait. Uh, well, I mean, uh, as an introduction, but kind of like repeating a little bit of what we, what I explained before. Uh, you see my screen, right? Yes. 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 Cool. Yeah. So um, the workshop uh, that John is uh, kindly in. Um, We'll focus on the discrete uh, methods at a, at a material level, right? Um, based on voxelization strategies. So just to run through this very quickly. Yeah. Um, so essentially, this is based on a, um, more literally in one of the projects we did that is part of our longer term research in, in RC4 on uh, discrete aggregations of linear fragments for, for robotic 3D printing. Uh, so it's essentially computing uh, line fragments, right? So they can uh, connect to one another, forming a, a continuous line. Um, so yeah, uh, as we approach it, obviously the workshop will be uh, a bit uh, like a simplified version of this, right? Yeah, much uh, simplified, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and you know also a little bit different. Uh, we did develop a, a, a software in Java for for this project. That is the the software that you see in the screen right now here, and uh, that would require a few weeks of workshops. So, <laughs> so this is going to be like a a little bit of a, a quick demo. Um, yeah. So essentially, the the method is to and you will see it, I think here. So get any object, yeah, and and run. Uh, I mean, a structure analysis. So you would probably simplify this part a little bit to identify part of, parts of the object that require higher density, parts of, uh, of this object that require less. Um, then this voxelized uh, object will uh, just generate obviously a number of cells. Those cells are voxels, and they will be linked to a certain value, right? Uh, which in this case, as you can see there is the this gradient of uh, spheres right uh, they are responding to the the structural stress values of the object uh, once we have that information we can then distribute what you see there or here distribute a series of lines through the object again in our case uh, we have two different lines for um, air printing and then two different lines that are flat to generate areas with higher density and then I, I believe uh, the code that you will be sewing will also rotate these lines so that they can be connected uh, yes. and, and create a, a continuous or at least semi-continuous semi-continuous line which is something that uh, was sewing a bit in more detail what you see there but then um, uh, was sewing it in, in a bit more detail in this other project I'll just go directly to the um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. So I, will, kind of uh, I have simplified a couple of things um, uh, within this definition and some things I've done intentionally, maybe, maybe wrong, uh, but I will explain why and how. Um, so uh, I will share my screen now, uh, which is this one. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So um, uh, I've got a definition that actually uh, at the very end, um, oh, I need to also open uh, a, a Rhino file, uh, which is, um, yeah, I've done it probably a long time ago. So I need to, to open another file here uh, like this. Like this, yeah. Okay, so this is the final result that uh, I'm going to to show you, uh, and also I will tell you why is it not and how is it not uh, exactly the same thing like like Manuel has shown, 
But um, first, I would like to, to show you the logic uh, behind. Uh, the thing is that first, you need to have some sort of uh, data that you want to use. Uh, what, what you were showing was the uh, stress, uh, stress calculation. So when you make a simulation of some, somebody sitting on a chair, it basically uh, div divides the space into a scalar field, which means like uh, in each voxel in the space, there is a certain value of stress. Um, uh, you can imagine that as, as like numbers uh, within an endless space and the number is either zero, there is no stress, which means you don't need to put any material or there is some stress and you can use uh, some very uh, uh, fragile and lightweight material and thin and somewhere you need to, uh, there, there is a lot of stress. Uh, which means or, or a lot of compression or tension and you need to use a uh, more uh, thicker and tougher material. So uh, this is something that we are going to do as well. Um, the difference is that I'm not going to make uh, a stress analysis of a chair uh, because uh, that would require uh, a lot more work. Instead, I'm, I decided to just make a um, uh, to use a Perlin noise. A Perlin noise, if, uh, do you know what a Perlin noise is? Right, I will. I will explain. Um, you, you do, of course, but do, do you actually do? That's all. Yes. Right. Uh, good. 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 Um, so, so uh, I think uh, people are answering in chat. So no, um, no. The parallel noise. Uh, I will show you uh, uh, on a website uh, uh, like that. Um, Perlin noise is an algorithm or actually a mathematical formula that gives you some randomness, but the randomness is smooth. So um, basically the sampler, uh, this, is a, this is a good picture. Let's have a look at this picture. So this is, this is some noise. Uh, each pixel has a different color and the color is random, but you always can make sure that pixels next to one another are more or less similar. So there is, a, there is no uh, big... Uh, contrast between the pixels next to each other. Uh, in other words, um, you can request any point in space and the formula gives you a number between minus one and one. And if you, it's a random number. And if you request uh, the value from, from a point next to it, the value will be different, but very close to the one next to it. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, instead of having a completely random noise, which is you can have black and white next to each other. In Perlin noise, uh, you always have some, some uh, cloudy, uh, wavy thing that, that is random, but also very, um, the, the, the neighbors have very similar uh, values. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, somebody says, I know it from processing. Uh, of course, uh, you, you use it there a lot. Um, and it's a very useful thing because you get the randomness, but also the randomness is somehow uh, visually pleasing, but also it allows for many other uh, things. So what I'm doing here is basically I'm um, sampling a space uh, that is filled with points with parallel noise, which basically gives me uh, certain values and the values are close to each other. Um, and, and the values are between minus one and one. So um, first I generated, I'm just going to show you the grasshopper definition. Uh, I'm generating um, a lot of points. So this is a cube full of points. Then I'm requesting the value of, uh, of the Perlin noise for each of these points. And it gives me numbers between minus one and one. So you can imagine that I'm as associating certain value for, to, to each of the points. Um, then I'm, um, this, is, uh, this component is checking whether the value is included uh, within certain domain. In other words, I'm asking if the value is between minus 0 0.15 and plus 0 0.15. That's the, that's the domain that I care about. Anything else I will just lose. And if you look now, this is what remains. So this is kind of a smooth uh, shape that I can make just by sampling the, the Perlin noise. And still, um, just, like, just like with the points, also the remaining points, they still have certain values. So it's not just they are on, but they have certain value, which is random, but 
one to one next to another is going to be similar. Just like with the stress analysis, there is a very little chance that you will have two voxels. One will have no stress and one will have full stress. It's probably also kind of gradual. Uh, this is not always the case in, in structural engineering, but more or less uh, we can say that it can be happening. If you have a homogeneous um, material, it's, it is the case. So still even the remaining um, points that I have, they still have certain value, um, but they, it's always in the domain minus 50, uh, 0 0.15 and plus uh, 0 0.15. That's uh, what I do here. So now I have these points and Manuel was showing that for, for the 3D printer uh, or actually for the, for the robot having the 3D printing and the factor, it's important to, to make a line that actually connects all the points and visits each point just one. And you do that for, for each layer separately. Um, and then you do something with the line. Um, here, I decided to take a little bit different approach. And I know that it's not uh, perfect for fabrication, uh, but I kind of like it uh, as, a, as a visual thing. Um, instead of uh, putting that into layers, I decided to, to just find a connecting line between uh, points. Uh, it can also change the, the vertical layers. So there will be a line that connects the points, not only in the, ver in the, in the horizontal layer, but it can go also upwards and downwards and so on. Uh, and because I didn't really want to bother to optimize, um, I just, um, I just uh, didn't mind that uh, the lines are kind of random. And basically I end up having more than one, uh, one such line. I'm actually end, ending up having a lot of lines like that. Um, this is what is calculating them. And I can show you what does it do. Um, uh, just uh, let me now do it like this. I need to actually stop this because it's slowing down my computer. It's actually kind of slow, but uh, still not like, um, it doesn't take weeks or anything. So now you see that uh, my space actually, you see that there are lines. Uh, some of them are pretty small, like this one, this is small, but then there are lines that are much longer, like for example, this one, and it's connecting the points. Um, I, I'm making sure that I'm visiting each point just once, not, not more times. And um, eventually uh, this is uh, 564 uh, lines. Some of them are super short, like for example, this one, but some of them are incredibly long. Um, and this is, this is the starting point. And then I will start replacing uh, pieces of this line uh, with some ready-made shapes uh, like Manuel is showing. Um, the thing is that this is super simple to, to actually change to, to uh, like horizontal layering. I just like the visuality of, of this because we are not going to 3D print it anyway. Uh, so I can go through the logic. How did I actually create these lines? Also, uh, let me show you uh, the lines one, one by one, um, the polylines um, like this. Manu, if you feel like uh, commenting, just, yeah. I know that this is, this is not uh, 3D printable, I know, but still. <laughs> yes. It's okay. But still, it's, it's, going... it's super easy to, to change it to something 3D printable, and we can even do that. Um, so anyway, uh, this is one line. Then uh, another line is this one and another line you see, like these are the lines and uh, all of them together, they look like this. It kind of uses uh, all the, all the uh, points that we had in the space. Um, and I, I converted just uh, um, a point cloud into, into a continuous, uh, into a set of continuous lines. So, um, now I'm going to explain the, the logic. How did I actually create these lines? Um, I would just make it uh, significantly smaller because it's uh, really slow at the moment. So now uh, this, is the, this is the part that, these are the points that I'm going to connect with the lines. I will switch on uh, uh, Anemone. Uh, like this, and let's see how does it work actually. Uh, let's hide this. All right, it's still calculating, but it should be pretty quick. Okay, uh, it seems it's done. Now it's like this, and uh, let me just uh, do this. Mm. 
Okay, so here we have something like this. So you see that there is a line here. Uh, we can even have a look at uh, everyone separately, each line separately. And okay, so this is the first line, this is the uh, second and so on. And altogether, they, they look something like this. And I will explain to you what am I doing actually here in, in, in the loop. So there is a, uh, there are two loops nested one in another. So there is an outer loop, which is this one, and there is an inner loop. I will start explaining the inner loop, and then I will explain the outer loop. So um, I've got a pool of all the points. Like these are all the points, and I need to somehow connect them with a the line. Um, I will select one point, a random point where I want to start. It's this one. And then I will do this thing repetitively. I will take out that one point from, uh, from the pool of points. Mm. Wait, that's, ah, okay. Uh, I need to restart. So there is this point at the beginning and these are all the other points, like all, all other points that are remaining. So this one sh should grow and it should pick a direction from a pool of points that looks like this. So um, I will take, um, so I, I take uh, the, the point and I measure the distance of this point of the, the original point. Uh, actually, I should be doing um, this. No, wait, 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 D1. Yeah, I think so. I should be actually doing this instead. Let's see. Okay, looks good. Mm. Okay, so I, I take this point and measure a distance from this point to all the other points. And if the distance is smaller than the size of one voxel, which, which is one unit, if the distance is smaller or equal, then they are probably neighbors. So here you can see that, um, that if the distance is small, I, I know who are the neighbors. And instead of working with the uh, points themselves, I'm working uh, with, uh, oh yeah, uh, because I need to stop the repetition here. Now it's repeating way too much. So um, I will show you. List. So this is the point that I'm checking and these are the neighbors. So this point can grow to any of these points uh, because that's a neighbor. And because we are not optimizing here, I just randomly pick one of the neighbors as the continuation. And then I will remove that neighbor from the list of points, uh, available points, and I will add it as the next point of, of, of the current curve that I'm drawing. So um, eventually I already have two of these points. And in the next step of the loop, so instead of having just uh, one repetition, I will have two. So now we are in the next step and I can check uh, which is, which point am I checking right now? So it should be, um, actually that was correct what I had there. Uh, I removed something from, uh, from the definition and actually it was a bad idea because I actually broke it. So I, uh, should uh, get back to it as it was like this. Um, yeah, that's correct. So uh, now I'm, one more time. So now uh, the, the neighbor, uh, I'm looking for neighbors of, of this point. It's not the one that I, I had before. It's the neighbor that I picked. So it's the second point of the polyline. And again, I'm checking who are the neighbors, available neighbors of this point. Uh, the good part is that uh, out of the pool, I have already uh, removed the ones that were used. So uh, you, can, you can see that I already used these two and I'm checking this one. And this one is not uh, a possible neighbor anymore because it was removed from the pool of possible neighbors. The, the pool of possible neighbors now is uh, just contains the remaining uh, points, these and these two are missing. So again, I pick one random uh, neighbor, which is this one and I add it to the 
uh, to the list. And then I keep repeating for as long as there are any neighbors. So at certain point, it can happen that this solution cannot continue uh, any further. And it happened right now. So now uh, this, is, this is the whole curve. If I draw a polyline um, like this. So this is the curve. This is the end of the curve. This is the beginning. And let's see what the pool of uh, possible neighbors looks like. So this is the pool of possible neighbors. And you see that, that there is no possible neighbor for, for this one remaining. And that's, uh, I check it here. And if there is no possible neighbor, I actually just uh, um, stop the loop. And at this point, I finished one of the lines. And there is the, the outer loop, which is this one. And whenever this happens, I say, OK, this is done. One, one uh, curve is done. And now the pool of possible connection, connected points is uh, smaller. It doesn't contain uh, the points of this curve anymore. And I can start the whole logic again. So I can start again. Um, now let's do with the second curve. Now uh, this is the pool. This is the random point that I'm checking. It's a different random point. Uh, the pool doesn't contain that point. And now this again repeats and generates some new polyline that looks something like this. And then again, it started here and it finished here and there is no possible neighbor for this one. And I can carry on and I can repeat for as, as, for as long as there are any points um, in the pool. So that's what I do in, 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 this, um, in this nested loop. Uh, if I wanted this to keep layered, I need to add one more condition. Instead of just checking the distance of, of the neighbors, I also need to remove those neighbors that have a different Z coordinate than uh, my own uh, uh, point. It's actually super simple. We can even try that. So uh, let's uh, deconstruct the point. Um, so this is, this is the point that I'm checking. Um, these are all the possible neighbors in the pool. And if the Z coordinate equals, then I keep, um, then I keep the neighbors. So uh, now this tells me, actually, I'm just going to uh, not to display the full names. That's kind of annoying. So I'm checking the Z coordinate. If they are equal, then they are on the same la layer. And I can just reduce the pool to only those points that are on the same level. So um, uh, I will just move it here like this. Mm, okay. And I will do the cull, cull pattern, and I will cull the list or reduce the list just to contain only those points that are on the same level. And then I can measure the distance. And also one more thing, because I'm working here with indices, I also need to remove indices that um, of the points that I haven't been using. So uh, just one more thing. And let's see if this actually works. And I will restart and let's see if this actually generates uh, something that, yeah. So it's a flat line now. And I can run the whole thing uh, again. And let's see, uh, let's see the result. I will restart from the very beginning. And you can see that now it's generating lines uh, within the floors. So now this is 3D printable, finally. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, at the end, we ended up having something like this, right? So um, it's kind of simple. Uh, of course, it's not efficient. It generates like not continuous lines, but some of them are pretty uh, pretty long, which is which is nice. And we can even keep it this way. Um, before I will um, explain to you the rest of the algorithm, I will just run this for for a much larger uh, sample, uh, and that can run because I I just uh, separated the. Uh, the definition to two parts. Now the first one is generating these continuous curves uh, or polylines and the rest is doing the rest. Uh, so, and, and, and the result here is internalized, but I will just run this with a larger set of uh, data and I will explain the rest um, meanwhile. So uh, originally it was 25 times 25 times 25. So a lot of points. Uh, and let's see, I will restart and let's see uh, the result here. 
So we can just observe a little. You see it's drawing something here. And now it's going to be layered. So it actually uh, will look different. But anyway, so let's have a look at the rest of the definition. So what do I have here? Um, at the end, um, I also check whether uh, the, no, I'm cleaning uh, the tree because uh, uh, somehow it generates um, um, some, some invalid data in, in, in the point list in the, in the data tree. And this data tree actually contains, um, contains the lists of points that when you connect them, it creates the polylines uh, that actually uh, then uh, can be converted to something else. Also, I'm checking whether uh, the, the line is longer than, uh, than two points. It has to be at least three points to actually be valid. So I'm checking if, if it's longer. If it is longer, I will uh, keep it. Otherwise, I will um, get rid of it. So this is a clean tree. Uh, eventually, this only contains, um, well, actually, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, three statistics, and it tells me how many branches it, it has. So it has uh, 275 branches. So uh, around one half of the branches is, um, um, somebody's opening a beer here. Is that right? No, it's a, uh, no, uh, no, it's a, it's a soft drink. Uh, anyway, so so it's probably just half of the uh, of the branches that I had before. So half of those lines were um, uh, super short, that, and I don't want to keep them. So I'm only keeping the long ones. And now, this is kind of tricky, uh, but um, I will try. Um, so no, uh, instead of trying, I will I will do something else. Um, now, Manuel was showing that um, based on the structural analysis, you get a certain number that tells you how, how much uh, pressure there is on each voxel. Uh, instead, we have the, the um, parallel noise that telling us some, something similar. And we can, we can actually uh, recognize three levels of, uh, of the pressure or, or uh, density that we need to achieve. And um, so it doesn't have to be three. I decided to just make three. Um, and I decided that um, for the lowest uh, pressure, uh, we should replace part of the, uh, of the polyline with something that looks like this. Also, let me uh, draw here, uh, or maybe I already have it here. I think I do. Okay, so this is the shape of the voxel. And you see that there is some curve that starts here and ends here. So basically, uh, we know that it's a continuous straight, uh, we can replace a continuous straight line that looks something like this. So a straight line that goes, uh, wait, a straight line that right now goes like this. That straight line can be replaced with something more uh, intricate. And this is just um, a very lightweight thing that we can use. Then there is a little bit more complicated version and the most complicated version. So um, I, just, I just expect that the more material I spend for each voxel, the, the stiffer it is. Uh, but in fact, I just decide this is just something arbitrary. I don't want to say random. This is something that I decided to, to use as a replacement for a straight segment. And if you look at all the polylines that we are generating, um, uh, like here, um, okay, this is the polyline. like here. So you see that some parts are straight lines. Um, I will also switch on the, the points. So if you look at this point, this is a straight line here and here. And some of them are uh, 90 degrees in angle and there is no other option. So um, no matter which direction the straight line goes, it's either a straight line or 90 degrees, nothing else. So what I was showing you so far is, is something that I will place at positions where there is a straight line. And what I'm looking at is this point should become the center of a voxel. So I will place a voxel here, which means it will reach half of here and half of here. 
Um, and then there are the, these 90 degrees versions. And I also have uh, sample curves for that. And you can also see that the curve starts here, then it does something and it ends here, which is 90 degrees. So I'm basically replacing um, something that looks like this. with my curve. So, so this angle will be replaced by this curve. And again, I've got three versions. This is uh, the, the light, lightweight version. This is a more complicated version and this is the most complex. And again, they can be anything as long as they start here and end here. It could be really anything. So uh, looking at, at uh, the curves that I have, now I need to somehow iterate over them and replace the straight parts with the straight version and the curved one, the angle one uh, with, the, uh, with the corner version. So I've got all three of them, of, of the straight one, all three of the, the angled one here. And now I just make, uh, need to make the right decision for the right uh, purpose. So what am I doing here? Um, if you look at any of the polylines, you imagine that the first place where I'm going to put a voxel, so if this is our, uh, let's, lo let's look here. If this is the beginning of the polyline, I'm not placing a voxel here because I, I cannot make a decision whether I'm placing the straight one or the, the, the angled one. So this is the first place where I'm going to put my, um, my voxel. So uh, that's what I do here. Uh, this is uh, called a cull index. So it removes uh, um, an element in a list on an index. So I'm removing the, the, the first, which means index zero. I'm removing the first element from a list. And then I reverse the list. And again, I remove the first element. I reverse again. In other words, I'm removing the first and the last point of the curve of the polyline. So there is no point here anymore. There is no point here. There is, you see that this is a super short one. So there is no point here, no point here, but there is a point here. Uh, then from the original uh, list of points, the, the long one, I am um, actually shifting the list, which means that, that I'm, I, I take the items of the list and just move them like one or two positions uh, backwards so that I can match the, um, the points or the values. And basically what am I doing? I'm generating here uh, a vector that goes from every point, like let's have a look here. I'm generating a, a vector that goes backwards and a vector that goes forwards. And I do that also for this one and for this one and for this one and for this one and so on. Uh, that's why I need um, the, uh, the shift lists and this is where I create the, the vector. And now I have um, the central point and it's backwards and it's forwards vector. We can visualize that, um, which is hmm, here. Uh, display vectors. So, so this is the backwards vectors. And also then there are the forwards vectors uh, like this. Now it will look kind of messy, but you see. Now this is quite important because there is, a, there is a, a component that is called orient and it basically takes uh, one construction plane. Uh, no, it takes a geometry and grabs it by, by some uh, construction plane and aligns that construction plane to another construction plane uh, and the geometry takes uh, with it. So if you look at my sample curves here like this, they are, uh, placed at the world origin, which is like the, the basic construction plane. And this is the X direction, which is the red line. And this is the Y direction, which is the green line. And um, you see that I can align this shape or the voxel uh, from the, the world origin to a construction plane that uh, it's much easier to explain on, on, the, 
on 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 the angle on the on on the corner. So whatever was the x plane uh, x direction x vector before is going to be the forward vector, and whatever was the y vector uh, is going to be the backwards vector. So um, uh, from this point, it's uh, super easy. I will just um, this is what I do here. I'm constructing a plane that is located at those points that I care about, uh, which is um, which are these points. Uh, I know what the x and uh, y direction should be because it's the backwards and forwards. I generate uh, a lot of construction planes. I will make them look smaller so that it's easier for you to see. Uh, like this. You see that there, there are many uh, construction planes here. I will make them even smaller. Like this. Right. Um, we can we can have a better look. Uh, if there is a polyline, you see that it actually shows me the orientation of the polyline. And at that point, it's super easy. I will just um, I will just orient um, one of these uh, three uh, versions to that place, and it actually makes it continuous. Thanks to that, um, all these lines are basically continuous because they have uh, their beginnings and their ends uh, at the at the correct axes. Um, now, I skipped one part, and I will explain that part again um, or now. Um, I need to decide which one of those three curves am I going to use. So. Um, there, there are the planes and, and the, the origins of, um, or, or the points where I'm sampling. I'm again sampling the Perlin noise because it's, uh, it's a super fast uh, um, formula and it doesn't matter, it's, it's easier than, than processing all the data all the time. Uh, so I'm sampling again. I'm, I'm again getting some value in the, in the Perlin noise um, uh, from the Perlin noise. Uh, so it will be something between minus uh, 0 0.15 and plus uh, 0 0.15. Uh, we can have a look like this. So yeah, you see the values. And then I'm remapping the values, uh, the absolute values. So even the, the minus and the plus, I'm remapping. Um, and I change the, the number from uh, to, to what it is, uh, from, from what it is to zero, uh, one or two, which actually is an index to a list of possible uh, voxels that I would use. So basically this tells me uh, for the first point, place voxel uh, index one, which is the, the uh, medium density. Uh, for the other one, use, uh, uh, use voxel index two, which is the high density, and zero would be the low density, and so on. So it basically tells me which one to pick for each of the points. And I actually do pick that uh, here. This is the list item, and I'm picking from, from the list of, um, of the voxels, of the sample voxels and I'm basically placing them uh, properly oriented like this and it actually creates um, a continuous line. It is not welded yet but I'm going to do that uh, later on. Um, it's surprisingly a little bit more complicated uh, with uh, the straight lines because the problem is that um, because the forwards and the backwards vector, they, they are 180 degrees from one another, you basically don't know how to orient the construction plane. It could be anything. So, um, but because we are in an orthogonal um, um, space, so um, first I need to decide whether I'm making a straight uh, voxel or a curved voxel. Um, that I do by simply asking uh, whether um, uh, the, the backwards and forwards are uh, basically 180 degrees. The easiest thing is to calculate the dot product. That's some a number uh, that tells you what is the angle between, uh, between two vectors. And if it's minus one, it means that they are 180 degrees. Um, so here I'm dispatching or basically just uh, bifurcating uh, the list of, um, of the data that I have here to something that is a corner that I explained, and also to something that is not a corner, uh, which is a straight straight line. And here, it is a little bit more complicated to create the construction plane. Uh, and you see that I basically decided to make them a little bit uh, skewed because um, 
I do have the X uh, coordinate, but I don't have the Y coordinate for, for the plane. Um, if it's horizontal, the Y coordinate could be always, for example, the, 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 the vertical, the world vertical, because it's never actually, it can never be the same because you cannot make a, because you, you never know which direction you go. And therefore, if you use uh, as a, as an X vector, you use something that is vertical. And as a, uh, as a Y vector, you again use the same vector. You cannot create a plane because it's not defined. So I'm creating now a vector that certainly cannot happen naturally. And it's a combination of X, Y, and Z vector, which is like 45 degrees in, in all directions. So that never happens. And I'm using that as a, as a universal Y vector. And the X vector is basically the forwards vector. And I'm then aligning again, just like before, I'm aligning the proper version of the voxel here to, uh, and it's actually never happening. Is the, ah no no no, it is happening. It's just I just selected the wrong one. So these are the straight sections, and also uh, I'm picking from the three uh, density versions. And when I've got this and this, this actually uh, makes up the whole system, and then I can join the curves. And it basically gives me as many curves uh, that are now like curly uh, as, as many as I had uh, the original um, uh, polylines. So they were 275 or something. Yeah, 75. So also, also the result is 275. Uh, we can have a look at, the, at this. Uh, let me show you. Uh, I will hide the, I'm going to hide this. Uh, the Perlin noise. And it's still somehow calculating the um, everything. <laughs> I will also hide this. Okay, and now I'm drawing the original polylines with different colors. So uh, now it's in a gradient of uh, white and black. So you see that there are different colors of the, of the polylines, but what matters the most is this. I will hide this and show this. And I can also, also explain that. So now I'm drawing each one of the continuous curly uh, uh, lines with a different color. And you see that the red one is the, uh, there's mostly red. It means it's a very, very long, uh, continuous line that goes through the whole system and all of them are shorter and shorter and it kind of makes sense because it is the first one and the first one has the most options to, to grow within the pool and the last one has the least options so maybe it's this one that is just this short and how do I draw each one in a different color? This is the a color gradient uh, component. And uh, I think I've shown you before, uh, you basically said the, the lower and, uh, and upper limit, which means the lower limit is a value that uh, is represented by this color. The, the upper limit is a value that is represented by this color. And then you feed it values between the, the low and high. And it basically just samples wherever uh, the value falls and it gives you the color. So now I just, counted how many uh, curves do I have in, in this uh, data tree and made series, which um, in other words, I just created um, as many colors, as many I have uh, the, the polylines, and then I'm drawing, um, they are not polylines, the curves, and I'm drawing as many curves as, um, as I have the, uh, the colors here and each one is a different color. That's what I do here. And uh, that's it. Um, meanwhile, this hasn't finished yet. And that's why my computer is that slow. But let's see how many do we already have. Uh, so we've got 108 uh, curves now. Um, and we can, we can have a look, uh, what is it calculating for the moment? Uh, it is calculating now the, the horizontal um, sections so that it's uh, 3D printable. So it looks something like this and it's just very slowly calculating the, um, yeah, the overall thing. And maybe this would be really fast if I use the, the fast version of Anemone, but, but I didn't. But eventually, if I'm not broadcasting over Zoom, it wouldn't be that slow uh, at all. 
it takes a couple of minutes, but eventually you get a, get a result. And also it's a super simplified version of what Manuel was showing because basically I don't care just having a partial um, uh, curves. So it's not a continuous line. The, the robot would probably have to stop, race and go somewhere else and so on. Um, and also I didn't really uh, care too much about the shape of the curves. So uh, the, the result is not as visually appealing as, as the one that Manuel is showing because um, I think it's very nice to see there that, that the, the air printed um, part, parts are really like lightweight and then they look uh, even as, as if they were curved, even though they are not. And the, and the horizontal uh, layered version, it, it, it really is a massive thing. And here uh, I maybe uh, could have decided uh, and, and differently and, and could have created different shapes of the, of the voxels that I'm using to make it more obvious where it gets curly and where it's, uh, where it's not. But actually we can, we can even try that. Um, meanwhile, well, this is more or less it. If you have questions or if some part was so unclear that you want me to explain again, just, just go ahead and we can, we can discuss that. I will, I will try to make the, the basic version uh, completely straight so that we see that some, sometime, some, some, at some places it's going to be straight and then it makes the curve and, and so on. So anybody wants to say something? We just say thank you, Dan, that's amazing. That's really ah. It's actually your algorithm. I just made it very dumb. Uh, your, yours was uh, very sophisticated. I just uh, washed out your, your sophisticated thing to make something that is uh, not that sophisticated. Well, my, my, mine was, uh, I have to say, a lot of sweat. Like now if you read that code, it has like all the thousand of iterations because we were designing while, while coding, <laughs> right? So it has possibly another 10 projects that can come out of it. Uh, this is this is more to the point, so that's good. Uh, but it also doesn't solve all the problems that that yours did. So, uh, yeah. Now you can see that some parts are straight lines. You can see it here. They I mm -hmm. pr replaced replaced, uh, and I can do the same for uh, the curved one. And probably it will bring more diversity. And maybe I can make the the central one. I can uh, turn it into a polyline which also will change it visually a little bit uh, so that it, it's slightly closer to, to uh, the aesthetics of, of what you did. So also the curved one now is um, the basic one is just a straight line that, that goes across. Uh, also it changed a little bit and let's just do uh, that one change uh, to make it visually more appropriate or differentiated. I will just um, rebuild. Rebuild curve. I just need to pause it for a bit because it's getting incredibly slow. So I'm rebuilding this and um, also the, um, uh, the degree should be, I think zero is, uh, is a polyline. Is it zero, zero or one? Uh, doesn't matter. Yeah, I can, I can do one that doesn't cost anything. And also like this. And now also this will be, um, yeah, I can recalculate. Okay, so you see that now the the most basic one is a straight line. Um, uh, the, the middle one is just just an angled uh, sharp sharp version and wherever it's uh, the highest density it's the it's the curved one. So there is some sort of uh, diversity in the in the shape. But it's all about the samples that you put here. Uh, I think we could actually achieve something visually very, very similar to, to what you did, but I just didn't want to, you know. Mm. <laughs> Wanted to try work. something different. That's cool. All right. Um, I, will, I will just let this finish and I am wondering how much has it already generated? Uh, just let me check uh, how long uh, will, will it take? And I will just save this. And um, so we have um, still like 3,000 uh, out of how many? 6,000. We are somewhere in the in the middle of calculating this. So uh, I will just let it finish. And when it's done, I will probably 
I just published the result and also I will save this as a, another version of this and I will send you the definition uh, so that you can play with it. Also one thing that uh, I'm going to show you, uh, when this calculation is done, basically uh, you should connect this with this. So I will just place it here and put it into um, a group because now the pre-calculated data that I saved is actually placed here, uh, but we are calculating new data and we can actually see the, the new data after it's finished when I placed it here, but otherwise they would have to wait uh, for a long time. I just don't want you to wait. Uh, there's a question. Uh, uh, it was a great effort. Um, yeah, well, literally, it, it looks just like effort. Um, but in fact, it works. I, I was kind of surprised that it works when I when I made it. It doesn't have the sophistication, but yeah, it works. It it does the job. <laughs> well, we can certainly optimize. Um, any any more questions there? Anyone? I will check the Facebook. Uh, Manu, I've got the, um, like two questions for you, if I may. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> can I? You can ask questions in your own work, so yes. Yeah, but I'm not going <laughs> to ask about my work. I'm going to ask about, about uh, what you were showing uh, before. Uh, I was wondering how many people are there in, um, in your team in uh, Nagami? Uh, um, well, it, it kind of fluctuates, uh, but uh, I mean, we have like a core team of uh, five people. Mm -hmm. um, and, like full time, right? And, and, and then we have uh, uh, quite a bunch of, uh, of collaborators depending on the task, right? So, I mean, we, we work with uh, uh, all the kind of profiles that you normally don't work so much with in, a, in, a, in an architectural office, uh, like a you know, PR agency, a sales team and things yeah. like that, right? Marketing. Uh, but the, right now, yeah, the, the, the core uh, team is, is five people in Nagami. Um, then, uh, then we have another uh, five people plus the three directors in in our in London, uh, which is the other company. Okay, yeah. that's uh... hopefully we expand soon. Like if if someone is very interested in uh, working working with us and uh, under the Spanish sun, uh, then send a request. Well, that's horrible. I wanted to do the same. I wanted to invite people to work with us, but how can we compete? How can we compete? It's, it's Nagami and it's Spain. And uh, come on, this is not Spain. It's like the summer, like three months here and it's either too hot or just rainy. Uh, no, come here. It's, it's amazing here. It's... Um... <laughs> Def definitely. <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, one one of the um, kind of uh, I mean something that I didn't really discuss so much in 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 the talk was um, you know the next stage to a new horizon of of the company, which is which is a distributed model, right? Uh, which is obviously a start establishing like mini Nagami hubs um, all over the world, but obviously starting from uh, um, yeah places with good weather. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just wanted to discuss this with you privately then, but nah. Yeah, the weather is not so good here. <laughs> it's okay. We we can still make exceptions if it's culturally very intense. You know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've got one more question. It's a very technical one. Um, when you when you develop your own software that is generating something like like the one that that we are now trying to emulate, uh, uh, what is um, um, like? Mm, is it a single purpose software, or are you trying to make it um, kind of general? Are you building up your own software that you just keep uh, uh, updating, or is it is it like single purpose tools? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I guess it is a little bit of both, and it goes back and forth. So uh, generally, um, 
when, when we start a project, um, we need something very, very specific that sometimes um, kind of ma makes use of uh, previous methods that, that I've developed. Um, uh, uh, but, but then normally it ends up to be its own beast, right? Um, so, but, but I think lately, like that's what happened, for example, with like soft modeling. Um, I mean, that obviously has like other opportunities beyond uh, what it currently does. And there is, there is a lot of like the voxel chair software or the discrete modeling software. Uh, that kind of taps into that. So there's always associations, but they end up being being their own uh, their own software. However, uh, that is something that we're actually working on, and especially in in our, uh, we're trying to combine these efforts to have a, a more flexible platform that um, you know it, it it works around ideas of of the discrete and, and automation, obviously, but but it has like plugged in functionality. That allows a pro uh, project to to develop uh, farther. Uh, so you know, hopefully, we manage to to centralize all these efforts in in in, in these platforms that just just uh, keeps on growing. Uh, but we are kind of at the beginning of that process. At, at the moment, we have everything in like in bits and pieces and uh, different kind of softwares. Um, we also tend to change the platform, right? Like, I mean, there are trends on on uh, software development. Uh, when I start, I mean, I started with processing, like I guess many others, and um, and then, uh, well, soon I start, I started just writing more more in Java without without uh, processing, and 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 then changed it to Python, and then Unity came came in, and uh, and then changed everything again, right? And uh, yeah, right now we are staying more in in the world of Unity, but some of our previous work, like for instance, this one uh, was in was in Java, so. It is a little bit of an effort to, you know, start migrating everything and compiling everything together. Okay. Um, it seems like we are usually taking the other for the uh, that we are always developing something that is very general and reusable, and we eventually never reuse. So, uh, I was just wondering. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, being uh, very robust sometimes. Yeah. It it offers a lot of opportunities, but you need to also take the opportunities to actually make it worth. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, because it is a very interesting discussion, right? Like if you want to do something versatile enough to allow a, a, a large multiplicity, a large variation of products to come out of it, uh, then you end up like, yeah, designing a modeling software or yeah, designing yep. Grasshopper. Right? Yep. Um, and, but you know we're, we're architects, we're, we're designers, and uh, you know I mean Nagami is 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 mainly focused on design and how to just make that design a, a reality. So in the end, it is a very specific process that that, that we follow, and um, and yeah, like I think it's it's like a compromise, right? Like uh, it only allows you to do this certain thing. Uh, that is very useful for me for the type of work I do, but then it doesn't make it versatile enough for other people to to use for other purposes. Um, so, I mean, that's a bit of a, obviously there, there is also, a, I mean, another part of the software development is almost the, the invisible one um, that is, is a bit more technical and less, less, less visual. Uh, so Nagami uh, works uh, in close collaboration with Vicente Soler and we have like a, a version of robots that is uh, more like evolved uh, Let's say it's a, it's a beta version that we always use, and then if it really works and demonstrated, then sometimes he, he incorpor incorporates it to the, the open source uh, software. And that, that is something that, I mean, Vitente is a much, much better programmer than me, and uh, he keeps on evolving that software with the experience that he has with people like us, uh, like Nagami, like Barlet, and so on. Cool. All right. Um... We can we can uh, ask again if there are any questions, uh, not only uh, on the tutorial, but maybe maybe for you uh, while we have this great opportunity. All right, it seems like yeah. they're not. Okay, there was so a I lot of fun story. <laughs> so. Yeah, but it was it was like it was incredibly interesting, and I'm very very happy that you took the effort. It was also a lot of um, energy that you put into into this, uh, and I thank you for that. It it means a lot. Thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure, you know.
So, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm, I'm also very happy about that, that, that you, you always agree. Uh, cool. Yeah. So let's wrap it up for today. Um, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to put this, uh, your lecture and this tutorial online tomorrow because uh, it's already quite, quite late. Um, uh, somebody is thanking uh, so much. It was, uh, it was great. So as I told you, uh, your lectures were great. Um, uh, and also your work, it, uh, it, it's stunning really. <laughs> anyway, so I will put this uh, stuff online uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, do you want to review the videos first or is it okay to publish? I think it's fine. I, I'm just not sure if the if some of the videos I was playing when I when I was letting the video play is the is the the sound was working or not? It was working. Uh, it, it's more or less okay. It's um, it, it was it was visible. It was not smooth, but but it was enough uh, to get the information and also the sound was okay. I think. Okay. All right. You're fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, now the, talk, talk to you soon. Yeah, yeah. That, that is the down moment of, uh, of uh, I mean, the, like the good thing of this, this uh, situation is that we can communicate all over the world and have, sure. you know, invite people from like w without yeah. the effort and so on. The bad part is that now we can't have beers to cel celebrate the end of the day. So yeah, that's true. Know, that's true. All more. Yeah. But people well, were actually having the beer parties in front of computers, everybody with their own beer and just, but that's strange, right? <laughs> that's what's the point <laughs> in that? Well, I found that, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's obviously not the same. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get through it. And uh, yeah, yeah. we'll start having physical beer soon. And uh, hopefully <laughs> I will visit even if it's not such a good weather. Or maybe, maybe you come over to Spain <laughs> when I'm there. And we have a real, uh, real beer. Yeah. Cool. Very That's happy. Real Spanish beer. <laughs> <laughs> is Corona Spanish? No, it's Mexican. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I've yeah, heard Corona it's really cheap now. Spanish. It's really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Um, have a nice evening, then, everybody, and and um, we are con we will continue tomorrow, and we are going to talk about. Uh, eventually about Subdigital, about our own uh, studio. And we'll discuss uh, with Tomasz, who is, uh, Tomasz Told, who is my associate. Uh, we'll discuss our own work and we'll show what have we done. And hopefully we will get, le get at least 10% um, uh, as, as interesting as, as you are. 